Oh, hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum, it develops standards, and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU journal, which offers complete coverage of communication and networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this webinar series launched this year in March will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open today our 10th webinar with Professor Muriel Medar from MIT USA. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. So please submit your questions via the Q&A channel and we will address them to the speaker during the Q&A session. After the talk and the Q&A, please stay online. We have something special for you. The Wisdom Corner, live life lessons. Professor Medar agreed to a very personal chat. So she will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. It is my pleasure now to introduce the moderator of this webinar, uh, Professor Iana Kilditz, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and Founder and President of Truva from the United States. So Professor Kilditz is Ken Bayer Chair Professor in Telecommunication Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technologies. And uh, in the last two decades, he established many research center worldwide, including South Africa, Spain, Finland, and uh, Saudi Arabia. He's editor-in-chief emeritus of Impact Factor Journals, highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings. He is uh, visiting distinguished professors in several universities around the world. And his current research interests include the 6G, 7G wireless communication systems, hologram communication, molecular communication, bio nano things, intelligent surfaces, nano networks, and many other subjects. So it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Akilditz to introduce uh, the speaker and to moderate the, the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Alessia. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening worldwide. I welcome you all the, to the second season and final episode or final presentation of our ITU journal, Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. I have the immense pleasure to introduce you one of the leading researchers in our era, Professor Muriel Medar. Muriel is an, uh, the NEC Professor of Software Science and Engineering in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at MIT, where she leads the Network Coding and Reliable Communications Group in the Research Lab for Electronics and at MIT. And she obtained three bachelors of science degrees in EE and CS in 1989, mathematics 1989 and humanities in 1991 respectively, master's degree in 1991 and the doctor of science degrees in 1991, 95, all from MIT. Muriel is extremely active in all four fronts in research, in service, also internally at MIT, as well as externally in the IEEE and other research communities. Uh, she served as technical program committee chair of the ICIT, which is the uh, flagship conference on the information theory. Uh, she did it the twice, Connext, YOPT, and many other workshops. She has chaired the IEEE medals committee and served as a member and chair of many committees, including as inaugural chair of the Millie Dressel House Medal. She was also editor-in-chief of the IEEE JSAC and also served as guest editor and guest editor for many, many IEEE uh, publications. And all of them are uh, leading uh, journals. Uh, she was also a member of the inaugural steering committee of transactions of network science and IEEE Journal of Select Areas in Information Theory. 
She is currently editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory, as well as elected president of the IEEE Information Theory Society in 2012 and served uh, on its board of governors uh, for almost 11 years. She received uh, many, many awards. Uh, it's a really long list, but I should really uh, read all of them. Why not? She received the 2013 MIT uh, WCS Graduate Student Association Mentor Award. Then she set up the Women in the Information Theory Society, as well as Information Theory Society Mentoring Program, for which she was recognized with the 2017 Aaron Weiner Distinguished Service Award. And she also received many awards within the MIT. Uh, she was recognized as Siemens Outstanding Mentor 2004 for mentoring high school students, as well as uh, 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 you know, serving on the International School of Boston as a, a, a member of Board of Trustees. Uh, uh, Muriel is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, elected 2020 member of German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, elected 2022, a fellow of the US, US National Academy of Inventors, elected 2018, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, elected 2021, and also fellow of the IEEE. And she has uh, many honorary degrees from Technical University of Munich, as well as from the University of Aalborg, 2020 and 2022. And she received many best paper awards, uh, also, IEEE Kombayashi Computers Communications Award and ACM SICAM Test of Time Paper Award, William Bennett Prize Award in 2009, Leon Kirchmeier Prize Paper Award 2002, and uh, uh, many other, like a dozen of conference paper awards. And uh, she has over 60 US and international patents and uh, many of them are licensed or acquired and she has co-founded code on as well as steinwurf for which she is currently chief scientist and muriel has supervised over 40 master students 20 doctoral students and over 25 postdoctoral post fellows uh, in addition to all these uh, professional activities Muriel is also a fantastic family person. She raised, I cannot remember now, four or five children, and she's already grandma at this young age. It's unbelievable, right? So apparently you can balance everything, family and uh, professional life. So she's a very nice role model for that. So let me express my sincere thanks to Muriel for accepting our invitation and giving this webinar uh, entitled Deviation from the Standard Toward Opening of 5G Telecom. Again, thanks a lot, Muriel. It's yours. Thank you so much for such a kind introduction, Ian. <clears throat> and thank you very much uh, to the entire team uh, for inviting me. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is a fantastic opportunity. It's a great honor. And uh, <clears throat> really looking forward to having a conversation with colleagues uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this field on some of the our, our most recent research. Uh, so the, the title here is uh, Deviation from the Standard. And <laughs> what I'm really hoping is, uh, as I said, to, to start a conversation on um, a new area of research. Um, this is all work with Ken Duffy, who's the um, uh, head of the Hamilton Institute, Maynooth University in Ireland. And let me start from scratch. I mean, this is, again, things we all know, but sometimes it's good to, to take a step back, and particularly because in this area, it, what we did was did a very deliberate exercise of taking a step back to reconsider what would be generally uh, viewed as classical, well-resolved, or at least well-studied areas. So what do we do in communications? Um, we have to correct errors. Um, and what do, how do we correct these errors? Well, we, we use error correcting codes. Um, so suppose I have a string of bits like the one on the left here. So I have these eight bits. The last one is a zero and that zero somehow is gonna to flip to a one. We generally have you know, two 
broad areas of, uh, of uh, considering the reconstruction of, uh, of the original bits. One is we call what we call generally hard detection, where we have no information, excuse me, about uh, the reliability of bits. Well, this is particularly the case um, if we have something like storage. Um, so here we have that the last bit was uh, was flipped, but there's no indication that that bit is more uh, is more um, uh, unreliable than the rest. And of course, there's a lot of uh, comms, including things such as uh, cable comms, uh, where where this is also the case. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, self-detection. Uh, in self-detection, we also have some information about the reliability of the bits. So here, for instance, maybe the, the bits in warmer colors are ones that are, one is less certain about, the ones in cooler colors are ones that are, one is more certain about. Now, in order to be able to do a reconstruction, it has to be that we add what we call redundant bits. Often I don't like the word redundant. It makes it sound like it's somehow superfluous or annoying or you know, counterproductive. Maybe a better word would be to call them repair bits because that's really what they are. But what we'll have to do is we'll have to have some additional information to aid in the reconstruction. That's what these redundant bits are. How much of this redundant slash repair information do we need? Well, you know, we would like to put in as little as we can while, of course, still maintaining a reliable reconstruction. Typically, what we um, use as nomenclature is that we'll have K information bits. This is the actual payload. And those K information bits are extended to a length of N. The rate, which is the ratio of payload to overall bits transmitted, is denoted as R and is the fraction between K and N. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So these redundant slash repair bits, you know, how do we construct them? And then, of course, how are they matched to the reconstruction? Well, currently, these are two uh, tightly twi twinned uh, uh, um, processes. So encoding the construction of these redundant bits and the decoding, the reconstruction based on the received signal, which includes these redundant bits, are those two are co-designed. And that leads to what we see right now in 5G and what we've seen, of course, in previous generations. <clears throat> we have uh, that decoders are matched to code. Now, one code may have several decoders, but uh, generally, except with you know a couple of uh, tiny, um, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, semi, uh, 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 semi uh, special cases, uh, one really cannot use the same decoder for for a different code. So what kinds of codes do we have? Well, we have, say, cyclic redundancy checks, which are, um, you know, pretty much everywhere. So omnipresent. Those are generally used mostly just for error detection. Again, occasionally they, they can be a little bit of error correction, just a bit or so. Um, Reed Mueller codes goes with majority logic. Boss Chaudhary Hockenheim codes goes with Berl Cam Master decoders. CRC aided polar codes, which have been included in the 5G standard uh, because they're so somewhat shorter and therefore are good for transmitting. Um, information that needs to be delivered in a timely fashion, such as control information, those go with CRC aided uh, success of cancellation, this decoder, and, you know, codes such as random linear codes, which are very easy to decode, of course, on the erasure correction part, because, you know, all it requires is uh, is to do Gaussian elimination at the receiver. Those uh, up until now had not been uh, for error correction associated with any decoder. Indeed, it was supposed that they were not decodable. Okay, uh, so this has led to this proliferation of distinct hardware, which is what I'm trying to represent here with this pile of chips uh, of different decoders for different codes, sometimes even just the same type of code, but at different rates for different R's may actually require a different piece of hardware. Um, and this particularly has been the root of the need for standardization. So recall that our, 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 uh, our title is deviation from the standards, you know, going away from standards. Why uh, do we have standards, you know, I mentioned CA polar codes, but for instance, LDPCs, which have been around since the early 60s, they were actually the um, uh, doctoral thesis of my um, uh, doctoral advisor, 
uh, Bob Gallagher, um, those who were chosen uh, for the data channels, you know, why do we need standardization? And, and by the way, you know, the requirement for standardization, as this uh, as this audience knows well, really comes with a lot of cost, a lot of cost in terms of inefficiencies, but also a lot of cost in terms of delays, uh, in terms of very contentious um, uh, discussions uh, regarding these choices. Uh, so let's again take a step back uh, and see you know, what are we really doing when we're doing this reconstruction. So when we talk about coding on an academic level, we usually mean really two types of uh, two different types uh, of actions, two different types of processing of data, which a priori would seem to be entirely separate from each other. One is source coding, also called compression. That would be like zipping, you know, doing using gzip. Uh, you have data. See here, maybe you have, you know, four blocks of a hundred bits each. And from that data, you're going to create a more succinct representation, hence the name compression. So maybe here go from 400 bits to two blocks of 200 bits. Uh, we then have a different uh, kind of coding, which actually rather than compress the data, expands the data. So here I go from 200 bits to say 300 bits. So in this example, my R, my rate is two thirds. Uh, and the reason I expand is because I'm going to be transmitting on a channel. And as we saw at the beginning of our presentation, some of the bits might get flipped in the same way that we saw that last bit get flipped. There might be some soft information, again, as we saw in our first slide. And this reconstruction, the decoding, the channel decoding, is going to be really what we'll talk about today. After channel decoding, there's a source decoding, and you know, for instance, unzipping a file, and we get back to the original data. There's always a probability of error, some loss possibility as we go through this cycle, but by and large, uh, the design is so that there is as little loss as possible. Okay, so let's first examine the first aspect of the coding, which is the source coding or compression. So how was I able to go from 400 to 200 bits? We have H of S, the entropy of the source S. So what this means is that somehow um, I was able for every two bits to come up with a representation which only required one bit. It means that the entropy was somehow below a half, that the, the rate of compressibility was a half or lower. That's how we were able to re re rewrite our data in a more compressed form. Now, when we went to the expansion uh, in order to, to transmit, uh, we would like that expansion, that rate, in effect, uh, the expansion to be as small as possible or equivalently the rate R to be as large as possible while still allowing the channel decoding to be with high probability um, a, um, a, um, a accurate reconstruction of what was transmitted. Okay, so the channel uh, uh, transmission we usually denote by X uh, because we're communications engineers, which is brimming with imagination, so we call it X, and the receiver uh, sees something which we call Y. The effect of the channel we generally represent as an additive effect, uh, often denoted by N, and really what, uh, what we have is it doesn't matter that it's additive or not, or not it just means that it's invertible. OK, uh, and it doesn't matter what the actual noise is. To some extent, really, all we care about is the effect of the noise. Uh, and this will be important later on when we look at soft information. We don't really care about the noise itself. We just care about the effect. And the idea that it's um, that it's invertible means that if a genie came and told me what the noise effect was, I could invert that noise effect and uh, on on Y and recover the X. OK. So let's look at this noise effect. What if the noise was itself a source? Well, you know, the most polite, unobtrusive, uh, you know, considerate noise that you could ever hope for would be a noise that would actually compress itself and place itself obligingly at the end of our transmission so as not to bother anyone. The real problem with the noise, of course, is that that's not what occurs. The noise just happens wherever it happens. It's generally uh, well represented in a stochastic manner. 
And therefore that noise, it just happens wherever it happens. We don't know where it happens. If we knew that it always just is represented at the end, we wouldn't have any problem around channel coding. What we would do is we just uh, send the bits and leave a little space at the end. So we'd send our K bits and we would leave N minus K bits at the end to accommodate the noise. In that case, as long as N minus K exceeded uh, exceeded the H of N, which is the entropy of the noise times N, uh, then we would basically have left enough space uh, for the compressed version of the noise to coexist, uh, coexist with the transmitted signal without any interference between the two. But unfortunately, of course, that's not what the noise does. So why is R less than one minus HN? Well, it is really because the best that I could ever do would be for the noise to compress itself, okay? And just to go to the end. So if you think of this as just a counting argument, uh, we went from two to the 400 possibilities in theory to say we really only have two to the 200 possibilities for actual data. Uh, that's why we were able to represent it by strings of length 200. We then took those lengths, the strings of length 200, we mapped them to lengths 300 uh, bit strings. Uh, and in terms of the noise, if we were to compress it, we have with high probably about to the N HN possibilities for those noise strings. Uh, the outputs are two to the N possible strings. In order to be able to recover uh, the data, it means that I have enough possibilities to cover both the noise strings and the original data strings, even though the data has been mapped to length 300 strings, there are only two to the 200 possibilities. So I need that the total number of possibilities, which is two to the NR times just from, you know, simple combinatorics to the NHN for all the possibilities with high probability of the strings. We need that that be less than two to the um, that two to the N, which is the total number of possibilities for Y. And that's where my R minus one HN uh, R being less than one minus HN comes in. That right-hand side, that one minus HN, um, many of us will recognize as being capacity. That's the capacity of a binary symmetric channel where H of N is the, the effect uh, of the noise, okay? So this is really where capacity comes from. Okay, so, um, do we know how to code for these for these systems? We can tell that we cannot get to more than one minus a ten from you know uh, basic uh, pigeonhole principles, or just from thinking of placing you know having having a the, the best channel, which would be a channel that compresses noise and places it at the end of the transmission in a predictable fashion. Okay. Well, Shannon in 1948 did tell us that actually no, no that actually this one minus a ten is possible. Um, and this is how he suggested at a high level that we proceed. He said, okay, remember uh, that you have, you know, say these length 300 uh, strings to transmit. Those are my Xs. So there was two to the 300 possible X strings to transmit. Uh, but you only had uh, length 200 original data to transmit. So you only had length two to the 200 or equivalent length to the to the NR, where N is 300 in the case that we're talking about, and R is two thirds, therefore NR is 200. Okay, and this is what he suggested. Make a bag. In this bag, put all the length 300 strings and make a very long shelf. And on that shelf, put all your two to the 200 possible transmissions, messages to transmit data. Pick the first one from the shelf, go in the bag, pick at random uniformly the first length 300 string, match those two together, record your matching, then put aside the first length 200 message, put back in the bag your length 300 string, take the second message, repeat the operation, so with replacement independently, match, record, and do this two to the 200 times. I... You, once you have finished doing that, you will give your interlocutor uh, that record with two to the 200 entries. You will then transmit to your receiver. The receiver will receive Y, as we saw before. The receiver will then consult that huge dictionary two to the 200 entries and observe which of those two to the 200 entries 
is the most likely to explain the why that they have seen. Okay, so it basically is going to do a to the 200 search and find the best explanation for the observed why. That's the maximum likelihood. Look, you can see that the maximum likelihood is the same as the um, maximum uh, a pre, uh, maximum a posteriori here. The reason is that all this length to the 200, uh, those two to the 200 length, 200 strings are all basically roughly equiprobable after the compression um, uh, process has taken place. Okay, so. We know what's the best to, to do, right? Or the, what's the best we could hope for is one minus say Chen. We know how to do it. You know, we, we know this since uh, um, since after World War II. So why are we not doing this? There are two reasons for it. First was the storage, that recording that I mentioned, that actually is very onerous. Second was the complexity at the receiver in having to check that massive uh, a book with two to the 200 entries in order to find the best explanation, the most likely explanation, uh, which is what we mean by the best, the most likely explanation for the why that was observed. Okay, so this is why this is not done. Now, the first difficulty has been obviated since the late 60s, early 70s uh, by, again, Bob Gallagher. He said, you don't need to do that whole recording. Instead, what you can do is you can take a matrix of size K by N chosen over a finite field. You can select the entries of that matrix in this finite field randomly uniformly. And by doing that, you will create a code which with high probability will be capacity achieving. So just to be clear, when we talk about the field of coding, it's not because we don't know how to construct codes. We know how to construct with high probability optimal codes for a long time. It's really the field of decoding. We don't know how to construct appropriate decoders. So the second difficulty, the computation difficulty that consulting of the book is really what has led the field of coding. Now, this is then what explains this, you know, uh, proliferation of different codes and these difficulties around standardization that I mentioned before. And what I'm presenting to you today is an alternate view. And instead of having this pile of chips, we have a single decoder what you see there is a picture of our actual first grand chip, which is uh, the first one is for heart detection. And we are able to decode all of these different codes. This is vacating the need for, for multiple decoders and of course the need for standardization. This means that to a large extent, particularly as we are mostly concerned with so much shorter codes. Again, uh, let's go back to the case, um, you know, the, the 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 case study of CA polar codes, which I mentioned earlier, as being you know a desideratum for ultra reliable low latency. Is that you know the that you have very good decoding, ultra reliable low latency short codes. Okay. How does this work? Well, let's go back to what I had said before, where you had this Y, which needed to have enough possibilities to accommodate both the possibilities for the X, of which there are two to the NR, and the possibilities for the noise, of which with high probability, there's two to the NHN. I'm dropping here the N in the H, so we're calling H here just the entropy of the noise. Here is how our algorithm works. We are going to take in the Y and we're going to take in uh, the code, but the code is just a codebook membership test. So think that rather than making a very clever code, uh, which is uh, co-designed with the decoder, all we're doing here is we're using the error correcting code as a mere hash. It's just a hash, it's just a checking mechanism. We'll first guess the most likely noise effect. Again, not necessarily the noise. We're not interested in noise. We're interested in the noise effect. After guessing the most likely noise effect, we will subtract, that is to say, invert um, 
And that's what is shown there with that circle with a minus. It's just an inversion of the noise effect. Going back to what I said at the beginning, we really just mean that we can invert the noise, that if somebody came and told me what the noise effect is, we would be able to get back the original information. Uh, we check whether that is a member of the code book. If it's not a member of the code book, then we go and repeat this. Uh, we go to the second most likely and repeat this until we find a member of the code book or until we decide that we have made so many guesses that the noise was uh, atypical and not worth continuing. And it is not worth for us to continue to try to decode because as we go through more and more decodings, we're actually increasing the likelihood that we will decode in error. So this is a universal decoder. It's suitable for all moderate redundancy codes. The complexity here is not in terms of the code, it's just in terms of the noise. So with this, the idea in terms of philosophy is that up until now, decoding was really centered around the code. That's the two to the NR num possibilities, just as, you know, uh, in effect, uh, was suggested many decades ago by um, by Shannon. But instead of doing that, we are actually going to the smaller problem, the two to the NH, to give you some idea of dimensioning, say that N was say around a thousand, then what would happen is you may say, well, this, this can be very large, but actually H, which is you know the effect of the noise in a typical terrestrial channel, uh, would correspond to a bit flip probability of say 10 to the minus four. Uh, in that case, if uh, 10 to the minus four is a bit flip probability, H is also the order 10 to the minus four, which means that NH is you know, less than one. So the number of, the typical number of noise uh, patterns to investigate is actually very small, unlike the number of possible transmissions, possible access, which is very large. And indeed we want it to be very large because we want our, our rate to be as large as possible. When we consider, for instance, the current state of the art, say LDPCs, uh, it's often stated that LDPCs are capacity achieving, which indeed they are. But if you look at the capacity of say current uh, 5G channels, it's usually, because of the argument I just said, uh, you know, one minus, remember it's one minus H of N, uh, the H of N I just mentioned is around, uh, you know, 10, you know, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four means capacity is 0.9999. If you instead look at the rates that are being used in 5G for LDPCs, they're 0.6 something of that order, sometimes lower, seldom higher, which means that you're using capacity achieving codes, but you're not using them in a capacity achieving manner. So the fact that you're using capacity achieving codes, given that you're you know, very, very far away from capacity means that uh, you're actually doing something quite wasteful and you're not using the codes uh, in the way in which it's generally understood that they are beneficial. Uh, here is just um, uh, an overview of our hardware uh, setup for the heart detection chip. I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of what this looks like. This appeared at ASS CERC last year, and it won uh, the best demo award when we demoed it at CompNets earlier this year. Uh, what you see here is a chip where we're using the syndrome, which is, you know, an, in fact, a multiplication based on that K by N um, matrix that I mentioned before is the construction of the code that could be random. Uh, you know, you can take that matrix and modify it to use it just as a checker. So the checking mechanism is very straightforward. Uh, but we're only using syndrome as a check. Uh, and you can see here that you have, uh, uh, for instance, in this example, uh, just to, to give an idea of some of the possibilities that are possible with GRAND, where GRAND stands for Guessing Random Additive Noise Decoding, it really should be 
random added invertible noise decoding, but grand certainly sounds uh, more pleasing than grind. Uh, what you see here is a primary circuit uh, where what we're using is a very low frequency because most of the time we have to do very few guesses. And only <clears throat> in the rare cases where we have to do more guesses because the noise realization is, uh, is more complicated, the, only then do we bump up the frequency. And by doing so, we're able to be very energetic efficient. And to give you some idea, uh, we are able to support all code families, BCHs, Reed Mueller, which we mentioned before, CRCs, which we're able to use as error correcting codes, RLCs, uh, which up until now were <clears throat> not known to be decodable for error correction. Again, they are decodable for erasure correction. Polo codes, CA polo codes, it's universal. Uh, in comparison to the state of the art, which for heart detection was BCH, what you can see is that our average latency in, micro, uh, in, my, in uh, microseconds, if you look at third from the bottom, uh, in terms of the rows, you can see that we're much lower. Uh, the it, there is a at the last in the last uh, column you see a um, some work which was done by the group of uh, Warren Gross at McGill University. That is a synthesis of our algorithm, uh, so that is why there's uh, no reported uh, latency. Uh, because they, it's not constructed. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of picojoules per bit, uh, we are very good, but uh, we're not uh, the the top one. Although uh, I I think we shall have some very pleasing uh, news to report there uh, in about a week. So please stay tuned um, and uh, and go to the web page that I will mention at the end uh, for some for some possible news there. But you can see also uh, that the average power uh, is the lowest of all of these. So very, very low power around three milliwatts. Okay, so with this, we're able to decode. On the left, you see codes for which there already existed heart detection uh, decoders. On the right, you see codes for which there were no existing heart detection decoders. They might have been soft detection decoders, for instance, for CA polars, or for, C for RLCs, there might have been no decoders available. In dashed lines, you see the theory. In full lines, you see our measurements. You see that they perfectly coincide. This means that we can do any code. So rather than being restricted with classic codes such as Reed Mueller, Reed Solomon, associated uh, polar codes, which are restricted in terms of code length shown here in the abscissa and in terms of rate shown here, shown here in the ordinate, we can actually use any code that we want, a random code, any old code that we wish, Grant is able to do them all. Uh, the benefits of being able to move to arbitrary codes are quite significant. Let me show you here some theoretical bounds. Here P is the probability of the bit flip. 10 to the minus two would be a very high probability of a bit flip, but quite challenged, but not uh, unseen uh, setting in a terrestrial network. 10 to the minus three would be a somewhat challenged, but a more typical type of uh, setting. And the block error rate, here's the probability that there was an error in the decoding. So on the top dashed red line, what you see is capacity, that one minus HN that we mentioned before, and uh, that capacity would be reachable if the code length, which is N, again, given there, the abscissa grew. Please note that we're not starting at zero here, we're starting at one half. So going back to, you know, keep in mind the kinds of rates at which people generally operate right now, I mentioned, you know, LDPCs uh, in, uh, in 5G will be operating typically at around two thirds, one half. You know, it can operate to three quarters or somewhat higher or say, uh, or say uh, maybe, uh, you know, in some very rare cases, 0.9. What you can see here is, you know, if we look at 0.6 as being pretty typical, is that with LDPCs, what you're doing is you're having the disadvantage of having very long, multiple thousands of bits lengths uh, and coming at rates which are, you know, say somewhere around here, that 0.6, which is really below what you could theoretically do with shorter codes. The uh, red line, the full red line, is a converse. It means that for those finite lengths, you cannot get quite to capacity. You're getting much closer, of course, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, you know, you're, you're, you're getting closer to capacity, but you're not going to be able to get quite to it. Uh, those uh, blue 
uh, lines are basically uh, achievability bounds, but it, you know I shan't go into exactly what the achievability bounds are. This was uh, you know those achievability bounds was kept from a nice repository maintained by my colleague Yuri Poliansky, who keeps a repository of nice bounds uh, called Spectre. So we we uh, gratefully acknowledge using those those bounds. But what we bring here is those uh, those dots, those purple dots. And what you can see is that those purple dots are just below the red line, are above even these theoretical feasibility lines. Just to just to be clear, those feasibility blue lines are not actual constructive mechanisms such that people can construct encoders and decoders. This is just to say there should be an encoder and decoder that does that, but it might be far too complex using uh, the you know traditional code-centered approaches, far too complex to construct. So here we got those 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 lines uh, uh, outperformed through through these dots, and the question is, what are those dots? Well, actually, those dots were just random codes, and when I say random, I really mean random. We just picked out of a hat, and that's what we did. You can see here random codes, CA polo codes, BCHs with uh, different block error rates for different rates. We can do you know 0 0.95, 0 0.98, 0 0.9 anything. Um, and our decoding region, it's not that the codes be short. <laughs> it's not that the codes be low rate. It's that the overall, uh, the overall um, uh, redundancy, that n minus k that I mentioned at the beginning, not be too high. So uh, here's a very, very comfortable grand decoding region. We've actually have made it lar uh, larger. So you can do long codes as long as they're high rate. Uh, we can get beyond that by using a concatenated versions, uh, which we're not going to talk about today. But if you have, for whatever reason, a need for long or particularly low rate codes, which again, we are used to working at low rates for, because of these LDPCs. But again, this is not a need. This is, this is, in effect, something we have chosen to do, but we didn't have to. We just chose to basically give up a lot of our throughput. And I think it's very interesting in the context of ITU's um, remit, where, which was uh, uh, you know, so nicely uh, introduced by Alessia at the beginning, you know, ITU's in charge of uh, assigning spectrum. Uh, you know, we're basically by using codes which are much, much lower than, than what we could do with capacity, what we're really doing is currently we're wasting spectrum uh, in a in a very severe fashion by using these you know rate one half codes and so on. Okay, let's go now to the soft detection because everything I showed you so far was hard detection. Remember, soft detection we now have some you know some color around these bits. We have some idea of their reliability. Let me show you here in the IQ domain a simple. Um, Constellation is just an eight PSK, eight phase shift king. So we shift the phase to go around a circle here. Um, and what we would do when we're doing the detection is we would have decision regions, which would basically be slicing the pie uh, of this eight PSK. And you know, if the areas are far away from uh, being close to the region in between these slices, so those. Oh, those orange uh, regions uh, that would be the, here in this case that we would be more certain and then the blue regions would be more uncertain, which are the regions basically close to the edge of these slices. How do we take that into account? Well, we're not going to take it into account by trying to describe the noise in a more necessarily finely sliced way. <laughs> Really, the noise effect is still discrete. You know, either the symbol was what was sent, or it's another symbol which is only a discrete number. Uh, the way that we deal with it is actually we're going to put that color, that subtlety, that reliability description into the probabilistic description of the of the flipping, and therefore that is going to affect how we select the most likely noise effect. So that is where the uh, the issue is, and is in selecting that. And you could do it directly from the full soft value information, but you know it's good for looking at limits of performance. We don't recommend doing that in hardware. Orbgrand um, is a way of using soft information, which I'm going to introduce to you because it's a very interesting, very statistical way of thinking of the noise. 
but there are other variants. You can also look at just a single bit noise reliability, symbol reliability, which is what symbol reliability SL grant does. Okay. So let's look at the log likelihood ratio are often uh, uh, used LLR of the Y, which is basically this uh, log of the ratio probability here, if I'm just sending a zero or one, what well, say BPSK binary phase shift keying, sending a plus one for one, a minus one for zero. We're just looking at this ratio, you know, which indicates the reliability again of a call of a plus one or a minus one, i.e. it was one or zero. So here is just in additive Y Gaussian noise, you can see the different bit positions for a length 500 code. And these are just, this is just realizations of that reliability. Um, if we were to look at the full uh, soft information, which is what S grant does, uh, and we were to look at how we guess with the full information, this is what would happen. So on the on the on the abscissa here, I'm just looking at the most unreliable bits. Never mind the really reliable bits. It's unlikely I'm going to flip them. But let's just look at the first few unreliable bits. So here we're just looking at the first dozen. So the first line, the way to interpret uh, all white, means that none of them are flipped. The second line, there's a black, uh, there's a black um, uh, rectangle there that means that that first bit was flipped. Second line, there's a black rectangle on the second bit. That means that the second most unreliable bit was flipped. Then third most unreliable. Then fourth most unreliable. And then let's look at the next line where something interesting happens, which is where the most unreliable and the second most unreliable are flipped. What this is saying is that it's more likely that those two unreliable bits were flipped rather than the single flip of the fifth most unreliable. Okay. So it's sometimes it's more likely that two unreliable bits are flipped rather than one more reliable bit be flipped. What that means is that Hamming weight, which is related to the concepts of distance, which have dominated the construction of deterministic algebraic codes, is actually not a very good metric. It's not a very good uh, a very good uh, proxy for how you should decode. Weight is not that important. And if you look at it again here statistically, if you look at the query numbers of these different possibilities of flips, and you look at the correlation, the Spearman's row, so the uh, it's a statistical measure of correlation between the query, the query number, the optimal query number, <laughs> excuse me, with full soft information, and the Hamming weight, uh, so for instance, two means that there were two bit flips, one would mean there was one bit flip. You can see that the row is not very good. There is some correlation, it's not zero, but it's 0.36, it's not a good proxy. If we go back and look at this and instead take these bits and rearrange them from the least likely to the most likely, and we look at its um, prob, uh, you know, from a more statistical perspective, we can see here different realizations, so different rearrangements of these sorts of pictures that I've just shown you here for one realization, so we can do this for many realizations, so sort of bit position from most unreliable to most reliable, and we look at the reliability in terms of the log likelihood ratio, we see a very consistent picture emerging. So without worrying necessarily about the probability behind it, but just looking from a phenomenolo phenomenological point of view at what's happening here, uh, we know that you know the more reliable bits are somewhat less interesting. They're less likely to ever show up as being flipped. Not that it doesn't happen, but it's certainly that's not my main problem. My main problem is the more around reliable bits towards the left. So how do statisticians think? Well, oh, the way statisticians think, and this is really uh, Ken Duffy's uh, insight, is they would map this to a line. They would say a good model for this is a line. That's to say that the reliability is somehow linearly related to the sorted bit position. That is to say that if I order my bits from less reliable to more reliable, the reliability is likely to be, uh, is likely to be linear in the bit position. Um, and in effect, if you look at the log likelihood ratio, the a posteriori bit flip probability is, of course, we know related to this LLR. Uh, and if I look at the probability that the noise effect, some 
uh, vector n n is a particular realization z n, what we have is that that is uh, proportional to the exponential an exponent with the sum of the LLRs of the absolute values of the LLRs. And what's going to happen is these LLRs are going to be roughly proportional to the bit position. That's what it means to have this linear relationship. Go if we go through the through the um, through the origin, it's roughly proportional to the bit position, and that means that it's going to the LLR is roughly going to be some proportionality beta, which gives me the slope of the line times i the bit position. And if we do that, then rather than having the Hamming weight, which as we saw was not very highly correlated, uh, we're instead going to have a different weight. So rather than just having the number of bit flips, we're going to have the number of bit flips ponderated, weighted by their position uh, in the list of reliability of the bits. This is what we call the logistic weight, which this is, a, um, uh, this is what uh, Ken has introduced in his ICAST paper last year. And, Duffy, and so this logistic weight then allows us to decode. Uh, so we can have, you know, again, uh, different block lengths, different rates, uh, uh, with different uh, block error probabilities. So here, imagine, uh, you know, a desired block error probability around, is usually around 10 to the minus 3, say 10 to the minus 4. So let's think that this turquoise light green is sort of the, the desired region. You can see that we can actually achieve this. Uh, here it's with an SNL 9.8 dB for BPSK, so bit flip. Uh, correspond to about 10 to the minus three. So we see the advantage of going from soft, from hard to soft, the sort of normal 2 dB advantage. And what we can see here is that, again, in the same way as in hard detection, uh, we saw that they weren't, there wasn't much difference between different codes. That is actually also the case in soft detection, but even more. In soft detection, the difference between uh, different codes becomes less and less. Going back to the issue around not needing, therefore, to have standards, you know, one of the reasons for standards was, of course, to be able to um, uh, to have these dedicated decoders, the transmitters and receivers talk to each other. If you have a universal decoder, that need is obviated. The second possible reason for having standards is that there might be some codes which are particularly good, so that even though there is a universal decoder, so that there's no reason at the decoder to have a standard, maybe there would have been a reason because some codes were particularly superior, and therefore we could just transmit those codes and not worry about the others. That is simply not the case. Codes are pretty much all the same. As a matter of fact, if you had to pick a code, uh, you would pick a CRC, the humble IP-free CRC. A well-picked CRC has, in our experiments, always outperformed but just a hair, but outperformed the other codes. What you can see is RLCs are not that bad. Um, you, uh, you know, CA polars are, are okay, but again, nothing seems to be as good as a CRC. We even did hear something a little fun. Remember, as I mentioned that, you know, the, the best possible channel uh, would be one where the noise place itself at the end. It would place itself at the end uh, and, you know, not bother anybody. So you could just leave a bunch of zeros at the end. This is what we did here. We just left a bunch of zeros at the end. Uh, and then we scrambled the whole thing by putting it through AES, which is actually not an error correcting scheme. It's just a, uh, it's a, uh, it is a encryption scheme, but it does a good job scrambling. And by leaving a bunch of zeros at the end and just using AES as an error correcting code, we again get a performance, which is actually very close uh, to design codes. So in effect, again, going back to the lack of reason for having a, a, a standard, we don't need the standard to fix the decoder. So there's no reason to pick, you know, you pick a standard so that you have a dedicated decoder. And the second reason, which would be that some codes naturally are much better than others, is also not the case. I should say that this was a surprise to us. We were pleased when we had a, a own um, decoder to think that maybe we could do code mining and find better codes. I'll talk about that in a minute. It turns out that pretty much there's no benefit to be had from a really extensive search for codes, which is why also doing 
machine learning for encoding and decoding is also uh, not, uh, not useful. It's also a waste of resources. Uh, to give you some example here, uh, where you can see these are different CA Polo codes that apply that follow the, C, the 5G standard. What you can see in dashed lines is existing schemes. Uh, so here we use the CASCL uh, scheme with a list size of 16 that was proposed uh, by uh, Tal and uh, our late uh, colleague, uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Alex Vardy, who tragically passed away a few months ago. Um, and you can see also polar codes. Interestingly, polar codes, um, you know, our performance is matches the original uh, capacity achieving polar codes. Again, as I was mentioning before with LDPCs, polar codes, you know, just because something is capacity achieving doesn't mean you want to use it, particularly if you're not using it to achieve capacity. Uh, polar codes are, are the first provably capacity achieving codes. As you can see, they don't do very well, which is why they have been replaced by CA polar codes. Uh, what we did here is we replaced all the polar bits with just CRC bits, uh, and you can see that that does the best. Um, uh, relative to CA polar, CA SCL decoders, we either do the same, uh, for instance, in the case of CRC11, or we massively outperform by multiple dB, as in the case of CRC24. Uh, we can actually uh, decide how many bits we have for the soft information. We haven't gone much into detail here, but we can change the number of bits. Um, I'd just like to point out that even with a single bit of soft information, uh, we can uh, outperform CASCL with a more typical list size of eight uh, deployed in most chips. Um, so we can, we can do extremely well. Okay, going back to what I mentioned before, sometimes, again, people ask, but, you know, really are all codes pretty much good? What if I use machine learning for constructing the codes now that you have this universal decoder? Uh, this is not work that we did. This is work which was done uh, by the group of Balatsuki Steaming uh, in the Netherlands. And they went ahead and just used random code versus um, a state-of-the-art machine learning uh, scheme for building codes. And you can see that they basically do the same. So there's really no point. Okay, so uh, I've shown you a new scheme for decoding. Again, remember, we talk about coding, but we knew how to code since the late 60s, early 70s from Gallagher. We were really code, we should really have been the field of decoding. Um, we have shown you uh, backward compatibility existing error correcting codes for any a moderate redundancy codes, whether standardized or not standardized. Uh, future proof devices against introduction of new codes. Uh, again, the introduction of new codes would be far less useful given that pretty much all codes, you know, except for a few like see, like polar codes, but very, very few codes don't do so well. And this is really going to enable, we believe, URLLC. I would like to, I actually, I should have changed the slide. I have here code available soon. Uh, we actually did a code drop uh, yesterday uh, of MATLAB code, if you want to play with some of these things. So I encourage you to go to uh, the website, granddecoder.mit.edu. There is some MATLAB code uh, for GRAND and ORB GRAND, the ordered reliability bits, that, that uh, explanation of how to use soft information that I gave you. You. And I look forward with this to questions. Thanks a lot, Muriel. Very nice talk, as always. Uh, I'm trying to get some questions in, uh, from the audience here. Unfortunately, there's nothing so far, but I will start to uh, Q&A session and then hope some people will uh, enter their uh, Q&As, I mean, Perfect. questions. So uh, again, thanks a lot for the nice uh, presentation. Uh, now, the issue is the following. As you know, we are, uh, we are trying, we are getting all these use cases, which are very uh, uh, highly you know, ultra reliable and also low latency requirements, meaning the computational time is a problem, I mean, especially mm -hmm. when you do the decoding at the end and also some of these devices <clears throat> when you look at the iot's for example they are very uh, 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 resource limited machines that uh, you know most of the fecs are heavyweight as you know 
And uh, like, you know, I 20 years ago, we worked on some LDPC and also BCH codes to show they work for the IOTs. And uh, now, <clears throat> now we have more uh, uh, strict uh, latency requirements use cases. And uh, how do you see, uh, shall we continue in the classical FEC approaches or shall we reset our minds and come up with something totally different direction? Uh, because we have all these now new uh, uh, contributions like intelligent services, they may help us to somehow tackle some of the uh, wireless channel problems. So what do you think about this? Great, uh, great questions. Um, so um, I think that, you, you know, I think that certainly considering much simpler codes, you know, CRC is about the simplest thing you can do to code uh, is useful. I think that for the low energy, low latency that you mentioned, Ian, this is a particularly good choice. Uh, if you see here, our, our power uh, is very, very low, is about half. Um, but most importantly, our, our latency and uh, let me see if I can maybe uh, just share. Uh, I'm sorry. I was going to annotate. I'm having a little trouble finding the annotation button. That that's okay. Um, but if you look, if you look here at um, at the um, uh, the third from bottom row, you can see our latency is one microsecond, which is far better than the state of the art in hard, de hard detection. And the power, uh, which is seventh from the bottom, the uh, milliwatts row is also the best. The decoding is very, very fast and is very, very simple when it is implemented correctly. That's really good to see, <clears throat> but you have also this family of the Code uh, codes, right? Like from BCH. That's right. All um, of these here, right? <clears throat> it doesn't really matter which code we use. Basically, all that really matters for the code is the amount of redundancy and minus K. This is really uh, too good to be true, in my opinion. It's really good. I mean, if the the results are like these, uh, you know, it's fantastic. But I assume these are only for the delays or latency addition uh, by the FEC codes, right? Like for example, is 1.04, it's just a decoding time, right? So this is the decoding time, correct? Which is, you right. know, it's a decoding chip. So that's yes. all you can measure, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you measure it going in but and you measure, it, you know, it, that, yeah. It adds up to overall end-to-end -end latency, but it's, it's really good, you know, fantastic. Now, here's another question that I would like to ask. I'm still waiting for some uh, uh, questions. From I think Gordon. we have some questions in the Q&A. Yeah, they should. There is one, but I think you already discussed this. Uh, Madhu Sathana. Yes, Karayan that's asked, right. Yes. Is it possible to reduce latency using Arduino C? Oh, Arduino IoT? C. Yeah, okay. So that's a good question. So um, we have not implemented this over an Arduino. Uh, we went directly for the chip. And I think, you know, this is a good question. So first of all, the code is fairly simple, right? Um, obviously, even simple things require care and cleverness in how you implement them to be done in an energy efficient and rapid fashion. It's also very parallelizable. So I think that the the latency reduction would be a very interesting aspect and be and doing it over uh, you know over in effect uh, an SDR or a um, or a uh, an FPGA. The reason we went for the chip is in a way that is the ultimate that's the ultimate test of a technology. Right. I'd also like to point out, you know, we, we did this over 40 nanometers technology. We did not push uh, the technology. So the, the results that we're getting are really because of advantages in our um, advantages in our um, 
algorithmic thinking, not because of advantages in uh, the underlying uh, manufacturing processes that we're using. Here's another question by Marzia Hashemipur. Uh, I told you in the beginning, we have uh, worldwide uh, uh, participants. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure where he or she's from, but uh, so her mm -hmm. or her is his uh, question is, you mentioned you are LLC, actually I mentioned, but uh, you talked about it, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, our M codes under RPA decoder have shown very good performance and can be a candidate for MTC and your LLC. I'm mm -hmm. wondering how good grant for RM codes for such applications is compared to RPA. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, by the way. If you have more Thank questions, you. please uh, 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 yeah. enter them in the Q&A. Thank session. you, yeah. So um, I think pretty much all codes do the same. Uh, you know, I think that that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, I don't think we should be fixing encoders and decoders is the bottom line. Um, I didn't talk about issues of fading or clumping of errors, okay? We have work where we show that if you have correlated errors, we can actually do even better because we can take into account the correlation in uh, in the guessing process of the noise. And why am I bringing that up? You know, when you have just random bit flips, or you've done, um, or you've done um, interleaving, you know, pretty much all codes are the same. When you no longer have those random that randomness of bit flips, or you don't do interleaving. And by the way, interleaving is very costly from a latency point of view, okay? So um, you, one should avoid down the road interleaving. We actually have a, a paper, a recent paper, uh, whose title is Ditch the Interleaver. So I'll, I'll let you guess what the, what the, <laughs> you know, what the message of the, from the title, what the message of the paper is. And the reason I'm bringing this up with Reed-Muller codes is Reed-Muller codes are pretty fragile under bursty noise. Um, so uh, I don't know about the RPA decoder, but the, remember, our decoder is optimum. So I don't know what the RPA decoder does, but since we're optimum, you know, presumably we do no worse. Uh, remember, we're provably optimum. So I... I, I would be hesitant about going to read Mueller codes there, uh, particularly for anything short. Uh, they don't do well under bursts. That's what we've seen. Does that answer your question, Marzia? I hope so. He, he or she doesn't, uh, she can answer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would, uh, so, you know, all codes are the same under under sort of white noise. When you get to bursty noise, uh, CRCs, BCHs are very robust. Reed Muller, they, they, they have issues. There was a, a, a question or uh, uh, some uh, opinion by Hesham Al Bakuri. He's at uh, Huawei. Yes, Hesham, lovely. To, was, yeah. Yeah, he says the link doesn't exist. I don't know what the Grand Decoder. Uh, uh, the Grand know. Decoder oh, link. Oh, maybe. Yeah, you mentioned that link. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that. Uh, I, it should exist. Uh, we went on it recently. Uh, if but uh, I will check uh, right after this talk. And uh, apologies if you're having trouble. Uh, finding it, uh, it it does exist, and I will double check to see that it's not down. But uh, just give, I'll ask you to give me a second there. Here is one more question from me, uh, uh, Muriel. Uh, as you know, like the last couple of years, uh, the direction for uh, uh, communication subjects are going towards more and more semantic communication, mm -hmm. especially like semantic errors. Like I call, you know, our classical way of error control is like syntactic errors, right? Ones or zeros. Now we are going towards the semantic meaning using like, you know, uh, logic or you know, first order logic, et cetera. And also from linguistics, some ideas. Uh, what do you think that, uh, at, you know, we have to go with that because machine to machine communications they cannot just uh, 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 
be, they will not be enough just for these classical error control schemes. So what do you think, so how we can combine all of that, like channel and source coding, they already do that, right? That's, by the way, this is not new, channel and source coding combination. Sure. You know, many yeah. years ago, you know, it was done, uh, but people are rehashing them from the semantic perspective. So right. what is your opinion about the direction of the research? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting direction. Um, I think that it's a little difficult to generalize just because, again, once it becomes semantic, it becomes very context dependent. You know, so in a way, the reason why it's useful is one of the reasons why it's hard to speak about it in, in generalities, you know. Um, I think that the general philosophy of being more is noise, more noise centric is, if you will, uh, useful, inherently useful, you know, exactly how that philosophy, you know, and looking at things from a more uh, statistical perspective, you know, rather than taking, you know, what we've done up until now is we've taken very, very simple models <laughs> of noise and then over designed to them in a way. You know, we've designed with more care than the models deserved. I think that, you know, if you look at this approach here of just fitting with a line, and by the way, we we have work where we show that you can fit with multiple lines, you know, to, to get a better, better performance, you can fit to two lines, as you can imagine, right? You can do piecewise linear. And you don't have to go through the, of course, you don't have to go through the um origin right you can shift and you can you can have a, a piecewise linear um approximation um i think that you know this is philosophically a little closer to the kinds of statistical models that are required for um for semantic communications you know so yeah. Uh, I, I think that the philosophy, in a way, is somewhat similar. Uh, the exact realizations really then become very, very specific to to the context. Uh, you know, uh, it would be good to come up with something uh, mixed, like syntactic and semantic, and uh, uh, trying to address the problem from both ends. That would be yeah. especially for the machine to machine communications. You know, as humans, we can always try to figure out what's, you know, what's going on. But with machines, robots and all that and things, they need to, you know, not only check these classical ones and zeros, but also understanding the semantics. Yes. Of research. Yeah. You know, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right. sorry. No, no, I was, I was agreeing with you. You know, the, the thing is, uh, for the time being, what I see in the, uh, in the literature is, uh, again, like this boxing, you know, box, like, you know, they say, oh, we just look at the semantic, but then they <laughs> somehow skip the syntactic one. So that somehow they should some, uh, you know, mix them and try to come up with uh, much more powerful yeah. solutions. I mean, yeah. I think that if you look at it from just, a, you know, a pure, let's say, mathematical perspective, then what happens here is going back to... To this picture okay just what happens is your maximum likelihood is no longer your maximum posteriori that's what happens yeah that's yes. what semantic means right yeah. you you no longer have that ml and map are the same so you can take the noise into account in computing the map but then you have a different a priori that's that's, that's really what it is that's that's the difference Okay, Muriel, thanks a lot. Unfortunately, Thank you. I have, uh, no more questions, and I uh, will ask Alessia to take over. Thank you. And talk to you about certain things. Again, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Bye. I love you. Thanks a that. lot, Ian, for moderating the question. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Medar, for this very informative talk. So now we move to the uh, Wisdom Corner Live Life Lessons and which is based upon the idea to give a unique and special angle to this webinar series, uh, uh, adding a personal touch. 
so successful researchers like you uh, will guide students and young scholars in the field of current ICT research. So I would like to ask you a first question, uh, which is your um, hard earned life lessons or, or failure uh, that uh, you would like to share with us today that might help somebody attending um, this webinar? That's uh, I think that's such a good question. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll point to something which was uh, uh, started uh, by a, a set of students at MIT, a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful uh, project named FAIL, and it's F-I-L, you know, exclamation mark. And they, they ask people who, you know, whom other people deem as successful to come and, you know, give some of their most uh, cringe-worthy failure <laughs> stories, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it was funny because I was a speaker at the first fail, and I started by saying, you know, um, um, I was I was asked, you know, the, the the organizer. I was very happy when the organizers asked me, and then and then they said I had been highly recommended for that, and then I started getting a bit worried. <laughs> How do you get to be highly recommended? <laughs> I've had a series of failures. <laughs> that was great. Um, I think that very often younger researchers get discouraged because there's a lot of bias in re reporting in the sense that people report their successes, right? And therefore you, you see the successes and you extrapolate and you say, well, whatever I didn't see in between must have also been fantastic. And, and the answer is it wasn't. Right. First of all, it wasn't. Um, you know, there'll be a lot of failures. Second of all, um, you know, we have this vision that because eventually very good work often does get recognized, but not always. OK, that somehow the recognition was fairly rapid, that people were, uh, you know, immediately pleased to see something new, different, that challenged the status quo. That is not at all the case, okay? I mean, the more new and challenging it is, the more people are gonna tell you that you're wrong, that, you know, you didn't think of this, that you didn't think of that, that, you know, it's too complex. I mean, you know, it's uh, that, you know, it's, you really have to persist. You know, um, I mean, Grant's a good example. You know, I had people tell me, oh, but it won't work for that. And, you know, I show them a curve. I'm like, yes, it does. And they, mm, but it won't work for something else. And just, <laughs> I'm like, try it out, you know. So I think that, you know, definitely not getting discouraged. Um, and if you really think that something works, just keep at it. You know, I had very much the same um, the same uh, experience with um, uh, with RLNC, randomly network coding, where you know, as I mentioned, the decoding there is very easy because it's just Gaussian elimination. You know, I mean, the number of people who told me, you know, that's because you know, I'm sure you can do better with routing, or I'm sure you, you know, and even when I had proofs that it was optimal, I would still get a lot of pushback, and 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 eventually, so you know, what's the lesson to come out of this other than persistence? You're not going to be able to convince people who are against something. You can't. All you can do is make sure that they're not listened to, right? And so rather than trying, you know, I used to spend a lot of time trying to convince people. And then I realized it's really a lot of work. And most of the time it doesn't work. Occasionally it does, but, you know, it's not worth it. Like, you know, just keep doing your thing. Just show what you did. Do it well. And eventually, you know, the people who are open-minded will convince themselves and the people who are not open-minded, you could not have convinced them anyway. So, you know, just to be less worried about that. Uh, like I said, the, the, the people who really have, you know, are, are smart enough and intellectually honest enough to come around, they will come around eventually. They may come to you with questions, you know, but that's different that, of course, you should answer questions. But the people who are just closed-minded, they just don't either too close-minded or, you know, not sufficiently, um, you know, intellectually uh, flexible 
mm-hmm. or you know uh, they, they're not going to get it so don't worry about it yeah very clear thank you and well the second question is linked to what you had said already which strengths in particular and capabilities uh, do you think students and young scholars should be most focused on developing and how would you suggest that they accomplish this Yes, I think that one of the things that's really useful for young scholars is to spend some time figuring out where their strengths are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because, you know, it's what we sometimes call the sweet spot, you know. Uh, Some people can be really good at going very deeply into something very narrow and making a big contribution there. Some people are better at doing more synthesis across areas and being cross-disciplinary. And it's really part of how one is. You know, I think it's the same thing as if somebody was considering, say, becoming an athlete, right? You know you're going to have to work hard. You know you're going to have to train. But, you know, you should look a bit at your own preferences and your own body type to figure out what kind of sports you might be good at right um and and it doesn't mean that you can't be maybe an excellent athlete at a particular sport it just means you really have to choose and i think that we 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 understand that when it comes to being a very high performing athlete but when you think of being a very high performing a very high performing um uh uh, engineer, maybe we we don't spend as much time. We give more generic advice, and I think you know, spend time figuring out, you know, what's your research type. You know, where do you find that you can really do very well? Um, you know, what things you can understand, and you know, what connections come to you naturally. What things you naturally become very interested in doing. Yeah, so sure, discovering your passion, your talents, and, and also your style your style, right? You can work, I mean, you could be a runner, but you could be, you know, you could be, you know, running the 100 meters, and you could be running a marathon. It's not the same type. Absolutely. Yeah. Fair enough. And in which fields and then which uh, which topics would you recommend students to study nowadays? I think that going in with a very open mind and actually just gathering a lot of different tools you know so I encourage the students maybe not particularly topics but you know classes to take you know take math classes take computer science classes uh, understand how algorithms work um you know feel like you have a lot of tools because it's really hard to tell what's going to come I mean look when I was doing my PhD you know my advisor told me okay, you want to do wireless, but, you know, wireless is dead. And I was like, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I don't care. (laughs) My mother taught ancient history, you know. Dead is, you know. I have to show myself that's terrible. I always heard that. (laughs) What a crap, really. It's dead, dead, yeah. I have to disappear. No, no, you can stay. It's It's okay. It's stay. And I was like, and I said, it's okay. Look, I find it interesting. If it works, it doesn't work. And I always felt like if it doesn't work, I'll do something else. I'll find a job. You know, I'm a, <laughs> you know, I'll, I get a PhD in engineering from MIT. Somebody's going to, you know, I, I'm a hard worker. Somebody's going to hire me, right? Uh, I'll do something else. It's okay. Um, and, uh, you know, that was not the case. I mean, the number of times I heard that, you know, coding was dead, you know, dead, 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 dead as a dodo, you know. And I mean, to some extent, I mean, that's a bit what I'm saying here, but it's different because it's like, you know, decoding is alive. You know? uh, so I think, you know, d- d- don't box yourself in, look around, get a lot of different skills. And, you know, when when Ian was giving his very kind um, introduction, you know, I have a degree in math as well as a degree in engineering. I also have a degree in literature, right? Like who uses that? And you do, you do because you use it in in how you write, how you think, you know, learn to think. uh, And and then, you know, most likely good things will happen. Yeah, I fully agree because I have a degree in humanities as well. So, (laughs) and it helps me a lot, even in the IT environment, which is pretty technical, I must admit, to think. You you you're 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 um, you exercise to think a lot. Yes. 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 
I agree. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you uh, if you can tell us one of the most tangible contributions that you made in your in your career uh, that had an impact, a direct impact on on your life, on others' life that you're most proud of. That's a good question. Um, I'm very proud of the work on the technical side that I've done with randomly in our coding. It's now being deployed, you know, companies such as Barracuda, um, uh, which is a software defined, one of the main software defined one area networks has deployed it. There was recently an announcement from Cradle Point, which is the SD1 uh, branch of Ericsson, you know, and many others. So that was a huge amount of work and to see that tech transfer, which, you know, Ian in his introduction mentioned uh, that, to my being chief scientist for time with that that that's that was a really tough slog <laughs> okay and again talking about people telling you you can't do it and having to keep doing it that that was a really really tough slog um so I'm really proud of that um uh, I think on the general side I mean the mentoring is something where I think everybody can do it no matter what area you know you mentioned the mentoring award that I received from you know for, high school students for from our graduate association also recently received uh for from the MIT postdoctoral uh, uh postdoctoral fellows association they gave you know the, the inaugural mentor award for postdocs that meant a huge amount so I think that those changes that you can make in somebody's career particularly when you're working with junior people and you're able to provide them you know it's like any you know we're engineers it's like you give a small direction correction of a few radians early on and it makes a huge difference in the trajectory so I think that those are very important excellent actually yeah. I was impressed by that when, when I read your your bio uh and uh, well not everybody can mentor by the way uh, we also have a mentorship program at the ITU I had some experience as a mentor not everybody Wonderful. can and uh, I actually was very impressed I was saying by reading your your uh your bio, but your professional path also includes outstanding and dedicated work with, with students and young scholars. Yes. With all the, the awards that Ian, Ian mentioned as well. Uh, and for instance, the one in 2013 at the MIT, the Graduate Student Association Mentor Award that you were voted by the students. Yes, right? yes. That, that impressed me. Uh, it, um, it gives a, it, it gives a, um, a strong message. And I was wondering, so I, I, I'm sure you, the, the students learned a lot from you, but I was wondering, is there anything that you think that um, um, they, they, you learned from them, actually? Is oh, there yes. <laughs> that you oh, like yes. Mention? Yeah. Is it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I learned a ton from them. Uh, I mean, I think that very often, you know, in looking at when particularly when people have big questions, you know, it, it forces you to yourself ask, well, well, you know, what's the essence of what you're trying to get at? Uh, and, it, and then you say, wait, did I think of it that clearly myself? <laughs> you know, when you're doing different choices. Um, so I think it definitely is, is very, very helpful. Um, and and, you know, particularly when people are making professional choices to realize that, you know, the professional choices are really, you know, successful professional choices are the choices that are going to make them happy and successful, you know, uh, and, and it's very different from person to person. It also, I think, gives you, uh, you, you feel more empowered to decide to do certain things or not do certain things because you think they're important or not important, regardless of what other people think. Um, because, you know, when you're giving that advice, you sort of feel then that, well, maybe I should follow it also. So absolutely, you learn a lot. You learn a lot. Wonderful. Thank you. I have last question. Um, is there a motto, is there an aphorism or, or a book or a movie, a piece of art or music that you believe describes you and you would like to share with us? Uh, I think, you know, if, if you asked my family, they would tell you what I always say. And I usually say it in French, I speak French at home, oh, yeah. which, is, oh, <laughs> peut, which is one does what one can. And, you know, I, I really feel that that's, you know, we do what we can and then we just try to do a good job with it. That's it. You know, uh, but that's probably my most used aphorism. <laughs> yes. Nice, very nice. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you so much, really. Thank uh, you. Ian, if you want to come back with us on stage. <laughs> love to do uh, that. Again, uh, I would love to uh, express my sincere thanks to you, Muriel. And I think uh, we should also mention again, I, I already mentioned that I think uh, one of your best parts of your life is you raise so many kids and you have grandkids. Thank you. It's it's really a fantastic role model for many young ladies. So it can be done. Again, thank you for your excellent uh, talk thank and uh, conversation. Uh, you always deliver what we expect. Uh, like a couple of months ago, you gave another talk, remember, for the Balkan Camp? Yes, yes, thank yes. So. And hopefully thank we'll uh, meet uh, this coming year. I hope uh, have so. a nice uh, time. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Thank all you. Of the above. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. It's been everyone. a pleasure to have you at the ITU Journal webinars. And thank you, Ian, for your outstanding contribution. Thank you, everybody. And this is the last webinar of the first series that we have this year. So um, I'll, um, I look forward to seeing you all online again uh, next year for, uh, for our next series. Uh, so thank you again, everybody. And thank you to my team. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Take care. Bye-bye.